I think that every bike should come with a dropper seat post. No fence sitting for me, the only thing I want to be sitting on is a saddle that I can drop out of the way with the push of a lever. But it's not just shred ready mountain bikers like myself that I think would benefit from the dropification of the bicycle. In this video, I'll lay out my manifesto for the dropper post becoming essential for all riders. But before I do, why not subscribe to the channel if you haven't already? I'll start by giving you a little history lesson because the dropper post goes back way further than you might think. Some of you may be old enough to remember Heightwright from way back in the day or even Titex El Norte Scopa two-stage dropper post from the freeride glory years. But droppers truly revolutionized mountain biking when they became mainstream in the 2010s. The Gravity Dropper and Maverick Speedball, later known as the Crank Brothers Joplin, kick-started the trend. Both were fairly popular, but arguably it was the RockShox reverb that truly popularized the dropper post for the masses. Over a decade later, and there's not many bikes these days designed for technical trail riding that don't come with one. Everything from enduro through to cross-country bikes are equipped with them. They are a common sight, but there's still no denying there is a price of entry. Not many mountain bikes under £1,000 come with one out of the box, for example. There's also still some bikes holding out, like a lot of super light XC race hardtails. But my question is, why? Here's the thing. I think every mountain bike, regardless of price or intended riding style, should come with a dropper post. And I'm not talking about a quick release seat clamp before you start raging in the comments. No, I mean a fully functioning handlebar remote control dropper post on every mountain bike. I would go as far to suggest that in order to fit them to truly budget bikes, brands should ditch cheap, nasty suspension forks and spec a rigid fork instead. The money saved can then be used to fit a remote operated dropper post. A lot of cheap suspension forks are pretty basic, heavy, unreliable and don't offer brilliant bump absorption. How many times have you read a review of a budget hardtail with a claimed amount of fork travel only for the reviewer to declare that they only achieved a fraction of that claimed movement? I'm willing to bet it's a fair few. Ditching the cruddy fork for a dropper post has clear benefits. The bike will be lighter for a start and easier to maintain. I get that a lot of people would be put off buying a rigid bike. They see a lack of suspension as a wrist-breaking, control-compromising deal breaker. And I totally get that. Suspension forks have been part of the stereotypical silhouette that make up a modern mountain bike for nearly three decades. But I'd argue that by taking the rigid leap and riders trying it for themselves, that wouldn't be the case for long. The next point on my dropper post agenda concerns geometry. A lot of budget bikes are still dated when it comes to their angles and measurements. I'd even go so far to say that as much as geometry rules the roost when it comes to how a bike rides, I'd place having a dropper post as an even bigger priority. A dropper post will give riders more confidence to work around that compromised geometry rather than being stuck with a naff suspension fork and a seat post up around their ears. Of course, in an ideal world, you'd have both. But put me on the spot and ask whether I'd take good geometry and a rigid post over bad geometry and a dropper and I'd take the dropper every day of the week. A lot of you will be saying there's nothing stopping you from manually dropping your seat post with the seat post clamp. And yes, you'd be right. And for years, I did exactly that. But with most riders constantly going uphill and down dale, the added flow you get from adding a dropper post is just too much of a benefit in my mind to compromise on. Having to get a multi-tool out every time you want to drop your post is an absolute pain in the backside. Even if your bike comes with a quick release seat clamp, chances are that that sucks too. It will be cheaply made, hard to operate and will seize up if you so much as look at it with water in your mouth, let alone send your bike down a mud bath of a UK winter trail. Of course, this is mainly just for budget bikes. Spend more of your hard earned money on a bike and it should come with a dropper post anyway. As for brands who sell their entry level for suspension bikes without a dropper post, well shame on you. Stop doing riders a disservice by omitting a feature you've clearly put a lot of thoughts into specifying on the more expensive models. I'd happily choose a cheaper drivetrain if it meant a budget full suspension bike I was shopping for came with a dropper post off the shop floor. A logical holdout of the rigid post has been the cross-country bike. Here, the quest to save weight rules all, or at least it used to. When the world's top racers are using 2.4 inch tyres, tyre inserts, 34mm or even bigger stanchion forks and in some cases even four piston brakes, the weight debate starts to lose its edge. 
racers are willing to take the weight penalty in order to gain that extra security on the descents. Races aren't won on the downs, but they are most certainly lost. To me, this makes it even more baffling why there are some cross-country bikes that don't have a dropper post fitted, even if it is a relatively short travel one. This is especially true of hardtails. Our senior technical editor Tom Marvin recently tested three cross-country hardtails for MBUK magazine, none of which came with a dropper post out of the box. There's an argument that hardtails make sense on smoother, less technical courses, and I completely agree with that. But when you don't have any rear suspension to soak up impacts, the chances of getting a race-destroying flat tyre increase dramatically. Here, your lactic acid-filled legs are your suspension. Surely, they'd be more effective if they had room to move about without the fear of the saddle interfering with your chest or, worse still, your nether regions. Is it honestly worth saving 300 grams or so by having a rigid post if your chances of puncturing are far higher than if you had a dropper? Absolutely not in my mind. If I haven't riled up the pitchfork wielding crowd already, then my next point may just turn into a full on riot. I truly believe that dropper posts should be fitted to drop bar bikes as well. Road, gravel, time trial and try the whole gamut of curly barred bicycles. Technology often trickles down from the top and we've already seen dropper posts on a couple of pro riders bikes. Matej Mohoric, pioneer of the now banned aero tuck on the road, won the 2022 edition of Milan San Remo with the help of a dropper post. More recently, Magnus Ditlev has been seen with a dropper post on his Scott Plasma. Why are these pros using them? For Mohoric, it's all about getting into as aggressive a position on the bike as possible when descending. This was the key to the much adopted aero tuck position he pioneered. Deemed too dangerous and thus banned, the dropper post allows him to gain back some of the gains lost. Just like in mountain biking, the benefits are felt on the descent. That's not just in performance terms, but in safety as well. Pro Tour riders are incredible bike handlers, but with a series of serious crashes on descents in recent years, perhaps the dropper post could help improve safety by allowing riders not to be perched way up on their saddle. Just like disc brakes, I have no doubt that the widespread move to drop a post in the peloton would be met with a large amount of disdain from fans and purists. But if it leads to better and safer racing, surely that's a move in the right direction. Even for punters rather than pros, the same benefits apply. Not only that, but us mere mortals have everyday occurrences to deal with on our road bikes. Having to stop at traffic lights and get going again, or swinging your weary leg back over your bike after a cake stop. These are just examples where a dropper post might be a small but welcome benefit on the road. Remounting and dismounting the bike, along with the aforementioned descending benefits, are perhaps the reason Magnus Ditlev has ditched the aero post on his Scott Plasma for a dropper. When tri riders are looking to save every watt, the move to a dropper is akin to throwing out the anchor. Clearly, Magnus thinks the benefits on descents and in transitions are worth the watt loss. Do you think we'll see more pro riders using dropper post in events next year? Let me know what you think in the comments. I've covered the shredders and the speed freaks of the cycling world, but what about the everyday cyclist? Commuters, tourists, the weekend family warriors, just more examples of people who could benefit from a dropper post. Bikes for such endeavours would benefit from droppers similar to those found on Marina's 160 and 140 mountain bikes. These offer adjustable drop anywhere from a diminutive 30mm up to a whopping 230mm. You get the same height adjustment as a regular bike with no need to worry the dropper won't be at the ideal pedal height when fully extended. Yes, there is an element of added complication for the user and additional maintenance requirements on bikes that take a hammering day in and day out. But if more people feel more comfortable and most importantly confidence when on the bike, then more people will come back for more and will have a happier, healthier population. Sounds like a win-win to me. So there you have it, my thoughts on the glorious innovation that is the dropper post and why I think everyone can and should reap the benefits no matter what bike you ride. I'd love to know what you think. Do you have a dropper post on your bike? Would you fit one to a road bike even? Let me know your thoughts and if you want to hear more of our spicy opinions, then check out this video.